French as well. I think this uh, imperialism of English, you know, is highly problematic, including for the English language. Uh, I think that, you know, the Francophonie is a very important, uh, I think, uh, campaign and movement. And I think, you know, we should support it as a minority language. Of course. Uh, are we... Uh, Okay, it's now streaming live on Facebook, so we, we might uh, begin, right? We might begin. Okay, 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 okay. then. So, well, uh, good morning, dear friends and colleagues. After an inspiring first day, this is the second day of our conference, the populist transformation of constitutional law, populist constitutionalism, and democratic representation. The conference is organized by the POPCON team, the research project on populist constitutionalism at the Aristotle University of Thessaloniki. Um, on our second day, we have three great panels and uh, an even greater way to kick off. It is our great pleasure and the true privilege to have Professor Kostas Duzinas with us. Professor Duzinas is so very well known to all of us that I don't think that I think I don't even uh, need to introduce him. Nevertheless, I'll, I'll say just one word. Um, a professor of law at the Berbeck uh, School of Law and founding director of the Berbeck Institute for, for the Humanities, Kostas Duzinas is a leading figure in the critical legal studies movement. And he's also an intellectual hero for many of us. He teaches, writes, and publishes extensively, and perhaps I should add passionately, on human rights and democracy. He is the author of numerous books translated into no less than 13 languages. His book, The End of Human Rights, published in 2000, very soon became a classic. His latest book, um, the Radical Philosophy of Rights, published in 2019, is already a standard source for any non-formalist uh, jurist. Costas also belongs to the rather small club of global thinkers and political theorists that do not shy away from actual uh, politics. He has been a member of the Greek parliament between uh, 2015 and 2019, during that is most interesting, even historic times. Uh, well, maybe not a philosopher king, but a philosopher MP, nevertheless. Uh, Kostas, we are all eager to listen to your lecture. The floor is yours. Thank you very much, Akritis. Uh, and I should start by thanking Iphigenia and your Akritis for a wonderful conference, but also judging from the younger people who presented yesterday and many of them are part of your school and of, uh, of your uh, POPCON uh, initiative. Uh, well, quite impressive, I might say. You know, I was really, really impressed by the quality of uh, the talks we had yesterday. And of course, by the critical sense that all of them exuded, something that we do not see very much in the public discourse of constitutional and university uh, uh, law professors more generally. And it is you and uh, Iphigenia, I think, who have led, as it were, the democratic and critical approach to law over the last uh, few years and have been uh, quite badly attacked over that period. I should also want to thank the younger people, those people who helped op organize and so efficiently, I think, uh, carry out this conference, Eleni Lapa in particular, but all the others who are behind the scenes and I think, you know, other people who make things happen. So thank you all and it is really a great, a great honor for me to be here with you. Now my talk, I would call it a kind of prequel, a prequel to the populist debate because I move back from populism or the popolo or the hoi poloi uh, or all these derogatory terms used about uh, the people to the people. So it uses uh, critical legal theory and my experience as a member of parliament for Syriza between 2015 and 19 
where I worked very closely with Akritas, Iphigenia, and other uh, law professors, the few of them who belong to the uh, progressive and radical left uh, in uh, Greece, uh, in order to uh, introduce some changes, some improvements, some, uh, some radical and progressive reforms uh, in the constitution amongst other things, but also more generally. Now, my argument is that most constitutional debates and conflicts from the role of the judges we heard yesterday to the recent major debate about the state of exception, the constitutional status of the state of exception. And again, both Iphigenia and Tacritus were quite involved in that uh, debate, that all these debates are shaped by and can be understood as expressions of the famous paradox between constituent and constituted power. Let me start with some definitions, and these are definitions that I have put also in the text that, uh, if I'm right, uh, at this point has been posted in the chat. So constituent power is the power of self-determination and self-rule of the people. It expresses the popular will to live together in community and organizes social reproduction, the way a people or a nation lives on. Constituent then power is transferred to the constituted power, the constitution, institutions, representative bodies, and rarely it is exercised directly by the people. What about the paradox? The paradox is precisely this. Constituent power appears only in constituted form. It must present itself as conditioned by forms. It is sovereign on condition that it is not. In constitutional politics, all power belongs to the sovereign people, but constitutional forms and institutions constrain and often frustrate popular will. Now, the young Marx, in his critique of Hegel's philosophy of law, made an important distinction, I quote, the conflict between the constitution and the legislature, in other words, the question of constitutionality of law, does nothing but ignore the conflict of the constitution with itself, a contradiction in the very heart of the constitution. Now, what is this conflict that Marx refers to? Hegel, his teacher, believed that the constitution stabilizes social relations by subordinating them to state sovereignty. Civil society is the space of private initiative and freedom, the state, the organic form of moralized power, Zidlichkeit. The constitution ratifies the already organized structure of modern society and state. Marx, on the other hand, advocates the idea of a democratic constitution, as it emerged in the French constitutions of 1789 and 1793. The constitution is based on the constituent power, pouvoir constituant of the people, with a completely opposed notion of sovereignty and a clear anti-hegemonic dimension, he writes. The French constitution is contradictory, paving the way for a collective self-rule that can challenge even dominant social relations. Marx understands the constitutional paradox, in other words, the relationship of constituted and uh, constituent constituted power, as the conflict of the constitution with itself, internal conflict. Now, a relationship is paradoxical or aporetic when two irreconcilable pro propositions, incompatible propositions, are equally valid. But for Marx, the relationship is not just logically paradoxical, but conflictual. And my argument today is that it forms this relationship, the organizing structure of all constitutionalism. This conflict lies behind all important arguments between democracy and law, between the omnipotent sovereign and the plural popular sovereign, between legal and populist constitutionalism that so much, uh, I think, uh, was discussed yesterday, between the formal and the material parts of the constitution, finally, between two forms of rule, le politique et la politique. I look at them in turn. And let me start with a very brief history of the idea. The concept of sovereignty and indeed constitutionalism descend from the legacy of political theology. 
as Carl Schmitt put it, all the important concepts of modern state theory are secularized theological concepts. And this is not only because of their historical development, they were transferred from theology to the theory of the state, where, for example, the almighty God became the almighty legislator. Divine omnipotence was transferred to the emperor or king or after the revolutions to the people in America, to the nation in France. The sovereign is powerful, it legislates and governs, but modern law is positive, as we heard yesterday repeatedly. It is positive by political power. This makes uh, the law historically changeable and potentially dangerous for those in power. The great fear of the rising bourgeoisie and liberal ideology, from John Stuart Mill to Dewey uh, and Dicey, the great uh, constitutional lawyer. So the great fear in the 19th century, but even today, as we saw around Greece in 2015, is that extending the vote to the uneducated poor or enabling democratic solutions to work, that would undermine the foundations of society or the EU today. Liberals demanded that political power be restrained to prevent the abolition of property rights. And this was the first task of constitutionalism. The law legislated by political power must at the same time limit this power, limit its father, its begetter. And therefore, that law that limits itself must logically come from a superior source. Constitutionalism answers this paradox. The hierarchy between God and the faithful is duplicated in that between sovereign and subjects, that between natural and secular law in the relationship between the constitution and ordinary law. If God is dead, as Nietzsche famously said at the end of the 19th century, his power was transferred to the constitution. And when the Supreme Court ruled in 803, 1803, that it can review federal laws for their compliance with the constitution, the outline of constitutionalism was completed. The constitutional text protects the balance of social power by removing matter and powers from the competence of majorities and entrusting judges with the policing of the future by the past. Independent bodies, we discussed uh, yesterday belong precisely to that tradition in its late aggressive state of post politics. Now, of course, some civil rights were also included in constitutionalist protected matter. And today they have expanded and they have become even human rights. But rights were not the main reason. Our experience with the courts during the Syriza government was that they were the most efficient opposition to most progressive policies. Of course, there are huge differences between Poland and Greece or between Orban and Mitsotakis, the right-wing Greek prime minister. And this is the reason why we cannot generalize for or against the judges or constitutional interpretation or whatever. As in everything else, the conjuncture and the balance of power decides every case, not some universal recipe that then we attempt somehow to restrain in some cases, expand in other cases, and have something that is rationally applicable in every case. Let me move very quickly to political, from the history of ideas to political. Constituent power is not just a logical way out of the paradox. All important constitutions are the result of revolution, liberation, overthrow of dictatorship, and totalitarianism. The constituent exercise in Philadelphia, in Paris, or in Trezina here in Greece, is a collective political act, a material force that changes the world. It is ontologically performative. We, the people, refers to who we are, the constituent, and what will, we will become, the constituted. The statement creates the people it claims to represent. Constituent power in that sense is the force that changes history, reproduces social existence, and remains hidden, but alive in the constitutional text. It emerges in a double movement in which it appears and is hidden at the same time. 
Constituent power establishes a new society, but is marginalized by its institutional creation. The constituent appears in the constitution as the world making power of people and democracy, but only the constituted form, constitution, institutions, personnel, become legitimate, even sacred, for some even fetishized. The constituent, which gave rise to it, recedes, becomes invisible. This way, the people appear to be sovereign, as most constitutions claim, but they're expelled from the formal constitution. There are many statements to this effect. Let me bookend this statement with Jean-Jacques Rousseau at the early uh, period and Pierre Rosan Vallon today. Rousseau mocked the Englishman who finds his freedom in parliamentary democracy, but he is wrong. He is free only when he elects members of parliament. Once elected, slavery returns. Rosan Vallon recently. The notion of constituent power, the normative basis of the political system, was founded not in the external factual will of the people, but in a complex of norms by means of which the political system excluded the people. Once declared by its representatives, the will of constituent power fell fully silent and the people were conclusively expelled, expelled from further exercise of power. This exclusion of the people is accompanied by a marginalization of constituent power. It is presented as mythical, superfluous, unproductive, if presented at all in a constitutional law textbook. Yet constituent power and the conflict of the constitution does not disappear, nor is it fully integrated into the constitution. It remains a permanent presence, a kind of underground current that occasionally breaks through to the surface. Similarly, the constituent subject, the demos, the people, or the multitude, is a never present potentiality. It lies behind every constituted form or exercise of its nominal power. In the perennial conflict of the constitution with itself, the constituent is the pole of democracy, popular participation, production, and protection. The constituted, the form of institutionalization that organizes the legalization of power and the internal coherence of the law, the Kelsenian moment, its outside limits, the Smithian moment, and protects the balance of social power, let us call it the Marxist moment. Constituent and constituted power are equally implicated. They are co-original, to paraphrase a different combination by Jürgen Habermas. The constituent is both a necessary reference of the constituted, but also irreducible to its logic. A political or a radical constitutionalism answers this conflict by erring on the side of the people. Indeed, the strongest mediation between constituent and constituted power emerges in popular resist resistances, uprisings, revolutions. It is what we can call the broken middle in the relationship. Since Kant, there is no right to resistance or revolution for the liberals. The constitution declares revolution both impossible and prohibited, in the same way that psychoanalysis talks about the real. Time and again, however, the prohibited returns in acts that challenge the ossified constitution or those laws that attempt to efface the force that lies at their foundation, the, the popular force. Over the last 10 years, in uprisings, occupations all over the world, the repressed constituent power returned most powerfully here in Greece. Direct citizen participation took place in constitutional review processes in Iceland, Ireland, Bulgaria, and elsewhere. People assemblies, popular assemblies, something that has expanded now all over Western Europe, uh, is another of those kinds of uh, nominal return. And of course, referenda of constitutional significance took place in Greece, the Netherlands, Britain, Italy, and so on. The genie of constituent power came out of the bottle. The people escaped for a while for 
the full constraints of representation. And I believe that we have entered a period of constitutional and popular flux. Formal and material constitution. The constituent power is not exhausted by its transfer to the constitution and representative bodies. Political power and law emerge out of and stabilize the balance of social power inscribed in what I call and others, of course, the material or productive constitution. This is the power of the working people to reproduce society through their work and relations. Work as collective reproduction and personal dignity. This is what lies at the heart of constituent power. The material part of the constitution condenses and expresses a society's class balance and has gone through four constitutional periods. The liberal constitution of the 19th century, which focused on property, freedom, or contract. The Lochnerian period, as uh, our friend uh, said yesterday. Post-World War II law recognized class struggle and gradually constitutionalized labor, its rights, and the class compromise of the welfare state. At the same time, those constitutions expressed and articulated the power of capital to control labor. The state promoted capitalism, but also institutionalized democratic possibilities. Now, the new world order after 1989 constitutionalizes an aggressive type of capitalism neoliberal. It adopted, adopts rather balanced budgets, austerity policies, extensive privatization, and restricts workers' rights. The European and global processes of constitutionalization now, a new term, lead this trend. These processes have no constituent power to offset market imperialism. The problematic relationship between popular presence and representation, which is the democratic element of domestic constitutionalism, has been replaced by the price mechanism. Market fanatics claim that global constitutionalism based on choice and the price mechanism is a superior form of constitutional reason. And it is a huge surprise that against this gradual elimination of democracy and politics from global constitutionalism, populism is seen as the major challenge to the constitutional tradition. Let me finish this point. The constitution divides into formal and material parts. The formal submits democracy and politics to law. The material, whether formally acknowledged or not, refers to the popular force that reproduces society and is reflected in the basic principles of economic and social organization. Capital labor relations are a key constitutional matter, whether they appear on the constitutional text or not. They say the economic and social structure behind every formal definition of power. Mainstream constitutional lawyers deny this materiality. Now, the former president of Greece and quite uh, uh, profound professor of public law, Prokopis Pavlopoulos, categorically refuted this view the other day. He stated that the constitution, I quote, exudes the socioeconomic ideology of liberalism and private initiative. It allows limited state intervention as an exception to its liberal ideology for the protection of the social system and human rights. It was an honest statement that, however, in the last two years appears to have retreated as very much of its social democratic aspect, resonance, is on the way out in the new government. I finish with this reference, final reference to politics. I argued that constitutional power and the conflict of the constitution is not exhausted in the constitution, nor is it absorbed by constituted forms. It remains a permanent process and flows like an underground current uh, uh, throughout the constitutional uh, uh, landscape. Constituent follows constituted power like a ghost that constantly and inevitably challenges, resists, resists and reshapes. How does this paradox then appear in politics? Let me use here the important distinction between la politique, I call it government, and le politique, the political, which transferred into politics Heidegger's important difference between the ontic and the ontological. Thomas Hjomos referred to it extensively yesterday, mainly uh, apropos of uh, Zakranskier's work, 
But this is, of course, a, dif a distinction that I think permeates the whole of radical political philosophy from Nancy to La Coulabar, Deleuze, Badiou, everyone has been writing about it. And you know, I have the weird distinction that I referred to it extensively in the Greek parliament uh, when we were proposing the constitutional amendment. Now, government refers to the conventional practices of ordinary political life around parties, trade unions, ministries, and parliament. The political, on the other hand, refers to the foundation of the social bond uh, with its deep conflicts and domination. The government or conventional politics operates within the boundaries, the constraints and opportunities opened by the political. It expresses, concentrates and temporarily mediates social and economic conflict on a permanent background of domination and unavoidable struggle. Politics is about government, the political, is about power, particularly social power. Here we touch the last of the great constitutional conflicts. There is a third player, a third player in the dyadic conflictual structure or paradoxical structure of constituent constituted power. The sovereign of traditional political theology. Constituent power is split between the Hobbesian sovereign which rises on stabilizes and polices social power, and the popular and democratic will which unsettles it. The will of a population to live together lies behind what I have called in my book, uh, um, Human Rights and Temper, bare sovereignty. And this is what establishes ideas of the common good, the public interest, or the commons. On the other side, we have the principle of one, of a single indivisible power that conceals its divisions between capital and labor, rulers and rules. Without popular intervention, no separation of powers or rule of law on their own can fully tame the Hobbesian sovereign. This kind of sovereign suspects the many-headed hydra, as it has been called, the multitude. It promotes representation of the presence, the rhetoric of popular sovereignty against its material exercise in popular and direct democratic forms. This dual meaning of politics became evident to me anyway, during the process of constitutional revision in a radical direction in 2018-19, when I started developing these ideas. The constitution and institutions reflect the class and political balance of power, as Pavlopoulos, a right-wing liberal politician, admitted, not many others. Institutions, of course, create strong normative expectations. They reduce contingency, entrench models of social relationships, restrict imaginative initiatives. These are reproduced and guarded by clusters of experts, organic intellectuals, who protect those uh, those kinds of institutional values by promoting their own authoritative interpretations and attacking and silencing the critics. If the revision process accepts fully the formal constraints that have been created and promoted by the guards of the constitution, I think the existing balance is reproduced. And did the strict Greek constitution has taken a procedural insurance policy against change. Its revision requires the participation of successive parliaments and increased majorities as many are other. This way, reforms that went to the core of the balance of power, not terribly radical, but they were about the balance of power, about capital labor relations and social rights, or reforms that deepened the democracy failed. They were passed by Syriza and immediately after the victory of the right wing, they were totally canceled. Only those not changing the class and political balance of forces were tolerated. At the same time, the only effective opposition to the government became a number of judges, particularly the Conseil d'Etat in many cases, which found unconstitutional a number of progressive policies. It was that experience and the attempt to theorize it that turned this thought to this uh, analysis. A final thought. In the globalized 
post fordist capitalism, social reproduction has moved from the primacy and secondary sectors to the economy of the general intellect and material labor and immaterial production. This is happening gradually, but the old idea of class, of trade union based on class and political parties representing uh, class is gradually moving away. Networking, horizontal relations, distant collaborations, life of mobility without security and planning, of course, cannot be easily reconciled with the politics of sovereignty and of the one, the domination of the past over the future. The material constitution and the plurality of people are gradually emerging as the force that will determine the formal or political power. On one side, new democratic forms. On the other, the price mechanism. So my final sentence, am I a left populist or authoritarian populist or whatever. Yes, I am a left populist politically. It was left populism the way that was, I think, analyzed yesterday by a number of people, which allowed Syriza to get to the position of, uh, of governing, of winning elections. Constitutionally, I'm a radical or a political constitutionalist. Radical or political, I take them at this point as Synonymous. It means that in the uh, dual, in the dyadic relations in constituted, uh, consti uh, const constituent constituted, the constituent has always to be there in court judgments, in political decisions, which have to deal with those kinds of conflicts that move between um, democratic force and popular power and the social balance of forces that we have in this are, is, as in every other European society. So radical constitutionalism, and then when we turn to the revision of the constitution, which is a totally different question from constitutionalism. Constitution is mainly about the relations between parliament and courts, constitutionality and so on. The revision is a different chapter. There we have to discuss precisely what preconditions and what kind of preparation and strategic organization any kind of progressive or radical left party that is in a position to revise the constitution, something extremely rare, of course, what kind of preparation they have to do in order to start gradually changing the kind of balance of forces, the kind of constituted power uh, that exists in the constitution. Thank you very much. Uh, I, I was slightly outside the, uh, the uh, most of the uh, debates yesterday, but I feel that some of these ideas, particularly when further elaborated and developed, might be of help in deciding this relationship between populism and constitutionalism. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Kostas. Uh... Uh, I, I don't believe at all that it is uh, outside of uh, the realm of, of our conference. I, I think it's to the core of it. Um, um, I also think that you lived up to your fame as being a speaker that your audiences uh, never wished you to stop uh, speaking. Um, uh, we all enjoyed your, your uh, speech. Uh, I understand that uh, we could uh, argue a lot about what you said. It is impressive how uh, a discussion that has been going on for three centuries now about the paradox of constitutionalism, the, um, the relationship between the constituent and constituted powers, and uh, uh, the, as you put it, uh, between the Hobbesian and the popular moment, uh, it is impressive how um, this discussion can be uh, presented in a new, in a fresh um, approach uh, every time. And this you have done by your, your speech. Uh, I, I only uh, keep uh, a phrase that I liked very much what you said, and I think it's a promising and optimistic um, approach. You said the genie of constituent power has come out of the bottle. Uh, I, I, I keep that and I like to write it down. Um, well, we have a few minutes 
uh, for a short Q&A session, uh, I see Figenia Kamsidon Costa Stratilatis, our dear colleagues, uh, raise their hand. Um, Figenia first and then Costas. If you need, you need to open your micro. I thought I did it. Thank you. Thank you again, Akritas and Kostas, for this uh, so interesting intervention. Uh, um, I love genies, but I'm afraid of ghosts. And I would like to ask you um, uh, if, uh, for instance, a women they want to abort. Uh, have to be uh, afraid of uh, the presence of the constituent uh, ghosts. Uh, if uh, uh, social minorities, uh, if um, uh, other minorities have to be uh, afraid of uh, uh, the presence of these constituent ghosts, uh, the constituent has no limit. Hmm? And uh, a very short comment. Um, <clears throat> I really, um, and with pain, cannot see everything, anything radical in the proposition of Syriza in the revision of the Constitution. Even the so debated and so ancient uh, regulation concerning uh, <clears throat> the status of the church in Greece, a status who gives power to judges, as you said, was not uh, uh, put into the uh, revision plan. So um, my idea is uh, it was uh, rather a, a, a question of politics and not uh, of politics. Thank you. Uh, Kostas Stratilatis. Uh, hello. For some reason, uh, I cannot uh, start the video. Uh, I, ah, okay. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Kostas, for this inspiring and insightful, as always, uh, introduction on a topic which is my beloved topic. Uh, I want to to ask you to expand a bit more uh, on the relationship between constituent power and popular sovereignty. Uh, this traditionally uh, constituent power has been seen uh, as an expression of uh, popular sovereignty, but correctly in my view, critical uh, and radical uh, left theory was always suspicious of connecting constituent power with the notion of sovereignty, which implied as you said uh, the one, the one and uh, powerful, and this is this is something that uh, may give rise to Iphigenia's fear, and for a good reason. My question has to do with this: uh, constituent power is a rather technical notion, rather distanced from a modern imaginary or popular imaginary, and uh, most probably the leaders who will appeal to people for constitutional changes will be inclined to invoke popular sovereignty. How could we, and popular sovereignty on the other hand is very useful because uh, it constructs in a, at a symbolical level uh, the subject of the people. Uh, the people as a subject uh, capable of action Whereas constituent power has to do with the action, we need some uh, symbolic uh, unifying or whatever uh, uh, performative uh, uh, element in order to, uh, to make sense of our being a collective subject. Uh, what would you say about uh, this? Um. Yes, Costas, please. Yes. Okay, thank you. Uh, thank you very much, Vianney. I mean, the point that I made is precisely, I mean, I kind of preempted your question, which I think is a very valid question. I mean, the first one. Of course, what is happening in Poland with um, abortion rights, with social minorities, uh, other uh, in Hungary and so on, uh, Muslims and so on, is absolutely appalling. 
my argument was that while there, the judges could be used to help in the situation that we have against those authoritarian governments, in Greece, it happened almost the opposite. We had some, whatever you want to call them, radical or progressive or democratic changes, both in terms of policy, in terms of the constitution, and they were lost. So the point that I was making, and I will insist, and of course, this is the point that I'm making in, I don't know, three or four books that I've written about uh, human rights and constitution and jurisprudence, uh, is that we cannot universalize as easily as a standard liberal rationalism asks us to do. You know, I heard yesterday this wonderful uh, young, uh, young scholar, Royla, you know, so to say that, I mean, you know, we need the natural law uh, because positive is least authoritarianism. Now, of course, someone else would say that natural law in its, uh, you know, relationship with uh, divine powers, the church and so on, is precisely, you know, the Demestre and the Berg kind of uh, reaction and so on. The point I'm making is that politics and democracy comes first. And therefore, in each instance, we have to judge the conjunction and the balance of forces. In, uh, in uh, Poland and in Hungary, I would be marching with the judges against the government. Here, I would be marching against the judges when they really more or less annihilated any popular initiative. Uh, you, know, the, you know, the law, and I agree with you, I'm not against the rule of law, I'm against this liberal cynicism, this, you know, full, uh, you know, gambit of lies that we hear about the rule of law, that somehow the law with all its great values and all, you know, the great uh, um, argumentation, tactics and so on, always gives a good answer. It does not. And we know that and you know it as well as anyone else. So that is my argument. It may be methodologically wrong. It may be unacceptable to a Kantian or to a rationalist. But I base it on experience. I base it on what we have seen both in this country and I think around the world. So we're not opposed to each other. I prefer the political solution uh, in, which, in which the law and judges, particularly constitutional adjudication, can be used in some cases and should not be used in other cases. And it is in that kind of context that I will also decide the most important revision part, what we're going to revision, revise and what not. So uh, there is nothing uh, radical in the constitutional amendment process. Uh, in some way, all three of us were involved in it. And in a sense, I would agree with you, but I think I gave again, preempted this this objection, which is an objection against me, uh, you know, not uh, just uh, your objection and against the critics, by saying that basically radicalism in relation to a constitutional revision has to be much better prepared, much better organized, and much more strategic. Because the point I was making, which we don't hear very much, that constitutions, in a sense, restrict and stream, you know, the way in which people understand politics and indeed uh, legal developments, that they restrict and somehow uh, eliminate contingency and initiatives, radical initiatives, that means that we cannot go like a bull in a china shop and try to change like everything. Because the balance of social forces and the balance of political forces in our case with the uh, win of the right wing government will just delete what happened. We had, as you know, you were involved, we were involved in a long process of preparation. We passed many of these amendments, which as you say, were not radical, but they were progressive. They were deepening democracy a little, they were returning to the social state and we lost them all. And not, not a, a, a murmur uh, was heard when the new government just deleted everything. And for me, that is a great trauma. It is a great trauma and you know, we have to first account for it, but more importantly, to see the lessons we can get because we have, again, let me repeat it, to distinguish between constitutionalism as 
the ongoing conflict between democracy and the people and the balance of forces and basically capitalism on the other hand and the revising process, which is a totally different cup of tea. I think people allied the two, confused the two. And to that extent, they just pass from their ideas about constitution and the constitution, what has to happen in the uh, re revising process. It is an important lesson. I think we have to uh, read it, to analyze it, and then see in the, for me at this moment, unlikely case that Syriza wins the next election, how we can play our constitutional politics in the future, uh, learning from the experience of the past. Now, of course, this, I mean, everything that you write and say, I totally agree with you. And of course, you know, I agree very much with your extremely, I think, important contribution. Yes, popular sovereignty is another, it seems to me, throw in that political theological descent from God to king to the nation or the people. And the difference between popular sovereignty and constituent power, as you put it very well, is that while popular sovereignty refers to the one, that the people are united as one. Remember what happens after elections. We had elections here in Britain on Thursday. Unfortunately, the Labour Party lost again. Uh, which gives the lie to those who are saying that it was always Corbyn and radical politics that lost the elections. So what were the people saying in the commentary rooms of the BBC? The people spoke. Suddenly, while an election is perhaps the only instance in which every citizen counts as one, one, and nobody has more than one, so it is the most, as it were, disarticulated sense of the people, then the result comes out, a statistical uh, counting takes place, and the people spoke, they become one. Now, the constituent part, as you very correctly uh, said, it's not about the one. It comes from a different tradition, and you could go back perhaps to the Greek demos, to the Roman Republic, or to Spinoza, Republicanism and Spinoza, and go all the way down to uh, current political philosophy, which does not talk about the one, but about the coming together of a force, a strength of people acting out of their own initiative and coming together in the action, not as a kind of constitutional statement that you are one and you have decided to the election. So in that sense, I totally agree with you. The constituent coming back into theory and indeed learning from a number of political experiences over the last uh, 30 or 40 years, tries to change that idea of the people as one and to go back to the idea of people as strength, as force, as power, that of course lies behind the constituted form, but it can also change it, not terribly radically, not in a revolution, not in taking over the Bastille or the Winter Palace, but in ways that increased popular participation in the democratic game. Thank you, Kostas. Um, uh, as this has been uh, a Greek exchange so far. Uh, we have a last question by an honorary Greek, Boyan. <laughs> the floor is yours. Thank you, Akritas. It's, it's rather trivial, but I hope nonetheless uh, interesting question. I wanted to ask Costas uh, his opinion. Why do you think Costas, this, this is about the final part of your talk, why do you think that this, uh, you know, liberal academia, liberal media continue to portray uh, Syriza as a sort of, a, you know, almost, you know, authoritarian force? Does it speak more about them? You know, and, and, I mean, Let's leave aside, you know, the mainstream. Let's let's look at the academia, you know, our fellow friends, the liberals. So if you if you look at the most of the accounts in the last five four years, you can use fingers of one hand to find people who didn't do that. So so there was this pervasive sort of uh, uh, you know attempt by the, the by the liberal uh, academics to basically say you know Syriza was a sort of you know quasi authoritarian you know aberration to the left. Yes, was it? Actually, I don't fully agree with what you said. I think I agree. Let, let me break my answer into three. Let me start with 
the left academics, the left academics, uh, many of whom, uh, as they have done, particularly left academics in, uh, in the Anglo world, you know, America and Britain, some also in France. Uh, these people over the years, after their very many defeats, uh, political defeats, and I think some theoretical failures, have invested in what I call resistance or revolution by proxy. They adopt different parts, maybe Cuba, later perhaps, you know, it was Venezuela or some third party, and they transfer their kind of political energy into those, uh, those revolutions or those uh, social systems. So Greece in January 2015 was precisely that. There was a transfer of a, a, a hope, an expectation that Greece would go against the EU uh, diktat and, and it would start the process of unraveling of austerity and the Washington Consensus in Europe and all the rest of it. And of course that failed. And after that, what is very uh, interesting is that for the left, for that left after the defeat, the compromise of the Syriza government, Greece was deleted, it was of no interest. They had betrayed, that was the standard position. Your colleague, or your compatriot rather, uh, Slavoj Žižek wrote a book entitled The Courage of Hopelessness, in which he said that Syriza was absolutely right after its defeat in the negotiations to again take on power and try to uh, do things uh, correctly. And then in the last chapter of that book confronts my position as it was expressed then with Varoufakis here and says, but Varoufakis is right. They shouldn't have signed, although he argued that we had the courage of hope hopelessness. So that is the left. Now, liberal academics on the whole uh, were interested particularly law academics, uh, those that I talked to and they were asking me because unfortunately Syriza did not try to communicate with the, uh, the, the international public. You know, sort of there was nothing coming out in English. I mean, the only book from our tradition is my own book, Syriza and Power, but that was written in 2016 or 17, I don't remember now. Therefore it was quite limited. So Syriza did not try to communicate. So the liberal academics, legal academics, we're also interested in that kind of legal challenge that Syriza put against austerity, against the European Court of Justice. It's very interesting that here in Greece, while everyone finds the, uh, the attitude of the European Union to uh, the Greek experiment totally uh, unacceptable, uh, they don't discuss Viking and Laval and the great decisions of the European Court of Justice that basically destroyed more or less some of the key workers' rights and moved neoliberalism into the legal system. So the liberal intellectuals basically were never particularly interested. They thought that this was a quite interesting, audacious uh, attempt by a small country, a small people, and even a smaller party to go against the orthodoxy. They work in the orthodoxy, they write books. Why the European uh, Court of Justice is such a great paragon of uh, the rule of law, the good and everything. And therefore, you know, these people went against it. We don't care about it. On the authoritarianism, I cannot remember anyone claimed that Syriza was authoritarian. They were populist, but not authoritarian. So to finish, uh, it was a great experiment. I am not sure that it will be repeated. However, it has created an archive, a record of huge importance. And for people in the academy, not just the legal academy, mainly of course in the legal academy as well, people like Iphigenia, Critias, others, uh, it is something that we have to work on for quite a few years because this experience, unique as it was in Greece, precisely of its, because of its uniqueness, can also help other European parties, other European theories to understand what is happening when you try to challenge the orthodoxy, whether domestically or in Europe or internationally. Thank you, Kostas, and uh, thank you to all the discussants for 
for an inspiring uh, lecture and, uh, and a very, uh, very interesting um, discussion.